welcome. We're going to get started in about a minute or so. We're going to let people um, trickle on, and then we will get started. Welcome to the Breast Cancer Actions Webinar, a briefing for advocates, the Institute of Medicine's report on breast cancer and the environment. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Saru Kaiser, and I'm the Program Associate of Education and Mobilization at Breast Cancer Action. On the webinar today, our presenters will be Karuna Jagger, Executive Director for Breast Cancer Action, and Ruth Ann Rudell, Director of Research for Silent Spring Institute. A few quick announcements before we get started. Stay tuned for our next webinar, which we will be held in February, and will focus on Breast Cancer Action's brand new Think Before You Pink Toolkit, which provides readers with explicit tips and tools for taking action to ensure that companies stop promoting toxic products in the name of breast cancer. BC Action doesn't take money from any corporations that profit from or contribute to the breast cancer epidemic. Our work is largely supported by individual donors please consider making a $25 donation today to support work like these educational webinars. I want, to get, I want to go over a few rules of webinar etiquette before we get started with the presentation. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and we'll leave time at the end for questions. Everyone except the speakers will be muted during the webinar to cut down on background noise and to ensure that we can all hear well. To ask a question, you can type it any time during the webinar in a pop-up box that should appear on your screen. We'll be keeping track of the questions and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. But given the number of attendees, we may not get to yours. You can email us afterward at info at bcaction.org if we did not answer your question. If you experience any sound quality issues during the webinar, try hanging up and calling back in. Usually that will fix the problem. You can also call Webinar Customer Support at 800-263-6311. Or if you have any trouble with the visual part of your presentation, try closing open windows on your computer and just run the presentation. We want you to get involved with Breast Cancer Action. This webinar is a great way to do that. Stay tuned for other ways we'll mention later on. Now we're going to go over the agenda for our webinar. First, Karuna will talk about the objectives for today's webinar, and then she'll talk about the Institute of Medicine and their new report on breast cancer and the environment. Ruthann will talk about what it means to study environmental health, the methodological challenges, and identify the environmental links. Karuna will then come back to talk about the report's recommendations, BC actions analysis and commentary, and next steps for advocates. We'll save time at the end for questions. BC Action was founded in 1990 by a group of women who were frustrated with the lack of information about breast cancer. Our founders, only one of whom is still alive today, knew that their private medical crises were part of a larger public health emergency and that the experiences of those dealing with breast cancer needed to be heard to address the crisis. BC Action's mission is to carry the voices of people affected by breast cancer to inspire and compel the changes necessary to end the epidemic. Our advocacy is conducted through a social justice lens because the politics and policies of breast cancer disproportionately affect poor women and women of color. BC Action's independence from pharmaceutical company funding puts us in a unique position to address issues of health equity and exposures to toxins in our environment and to put the needs of patients before pharmaceutical company profits. We have three main program priorities. Putting Patients First, where we advocate at the Food and Drug Administration in favor of treatments that are less toxic, more effective, and less expensive than those already available. 
We also provide information about breast cancer to anyone who needs it. Second, creating healthy environments where we work to reduce the involuntary exposures people encounter that put them at risk for breast cancer by holding corporations accountable for unhealthy products and practices. We also support legislation that would better protect us from chemicals in our environment and that would make personal care products safer. The last is eliminating social inequities related to breast cancer, where we work to create awareness that it is not just genes, but social injustices, political, economic, and racial inequalities that lead to disparities in breast cancer incidence and outcomes. Joining us today is Karuna Jagger, Breast Cancer Action's Executive Director. Karuna joined BC Action as Executive Director in early 2011, bringing a professional expertise in applied research and policy advocacy to her personal commitment to addressing and ending the breast cancer epidemic. Throughout her 15-year career in nonprofit leadership and capacity building, Karuna's work has focused on women's rights and eliminating socio and economic inequalities. Also joining us today is Ruth Ann Rudell, Director of Research for Silent Spring Institute. Ruth Ann Rudell is the Research Director at Silent Spring Institute, where she leads major exposure and toxicology research programs focused on endocrine-disrupting chemical exposures and on mechanisms by which chemicals may influence breast cancer risk. Silent Spring is an independent, nonprofit scientific research organization founded in 1995 by breast cancer advocates wanting to create a lab of their own to do research on environmental factors and breast cancer to identify opportunities for, for prevention. Silent Spring Institute is funded by government and foundation grants and charitable donations and often conducts its work in collaboration with academic scientists. Silent Spring Institute publishes their work in peer-reviewed scientific literature and also makes it accessible to advocates and the public. Thank you, Saru. Uh, the Institute of Medicine's report on breast cancer in the environment has been long anticipated, and advocates have been pushing for many years for more work on identifying causes of breast cancer and greater focus on prevention. So the IOM report was released in December of last year, and it was widely covered by the media when it was released at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. But the coverage tended to oversimplify the issues and overlook many of the important uh, factors of, in this report, and we're going to talk about some of those today. This webinar is intended to offer advocates, women living with breast cancer, people concerned about environmental toxins, and the general public with Breast Cancer Action's perspective on the IOM's report on breast cancer and the environment. During our time today, we'll provide some background and context to better understand what is the IOM and what does this report do. And of course, Roseanne is going to review some of the major findings regarding toxins linked to breast cancer and offer insights on the methodological issues in studying environmental health. I'll come back again to talk about the committee's recommendations, and we'll look at where the committee got it right and where it missed the mark. In particular, we'll, we'll talk about the limits of focusing on individual behavior and discuss the policy changes required to reduce these exposures to toxins that may be contributing to the skyrocketing rates of breast cancer and other cancers. Finally, we'll suggest some ways that advocates can use this IOM report to really move things forward. So this webinar is not intended to be a comprehensive review of all the science on breast cancer in the environment, nor is it intended to cover every finding and recommendation of the IOM's report in detail. Rather, we're really pulling some of the most important aspects of the IOM's report, giving context, and offering our commentary on the recommendations. The Institute of Medicine, which we refer to here as the IOM, was established more than 40 years ago as part of the United States National Academies. These include the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Research Council. Collectively, these are the Scientific National Academy for the U.S. Now, the IOM works outside of the framework of the U.S. federal government in order to provide unbiased, evidence-based, and peer-reviewed information and advice about health and science policy to policymakers and professionals and the public at large. The IOM is an honorary membership organization that brings together scientists, and other experts on a voluntary basis. Today, the IOM has approximately 1,700 members from a variety of disciplines. And membership is uh, folks are elected by their peers currently on the committee based on their professional achievement and their commitment to service. The majority of studies and reports produced by the IOM are requested and funded by the federal government. 
multidisciplinary experts come together around specific topics to examine policy matters pertaining to the health of the public. I also want to note that private industry, foundations, as well as state and local governments can also initiate studies, as does the IOM itself. So this report on breast cancer in the environment was initiated by the Susan G. Komen for the Cure, which paid a million dollars to fund the report and laid out the tasks of the committee, and we'll talk about those in the next slide. Um, the report was released last month at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. And the committee was made up of a multidisciplinary panel of experts from a range of academic and research institutions across the country, including healthcare, epidemiology, toxicology, biostatistics, and, and several others. Um, they sought input from stakeholders through public forums, and BC Action provided verbal testimony as well as submitted written comments through this process uh, over the course of a year. Review panel included representatives from the EPA, NIEHS, Silent Spring, American Cancer Society, and several medical centers. And so all this was intended to ensure a diverse perspective and diverse technical expertise. Before we begin, I want to note that in addition to the IOM's full report, you know, the cover of which is shown here on the slide, there are a, some supplementary documents, including, including a summary brief and a Q&A pamphlet. There are a number of substantial differences between these documents, and the bulk of this webinar is really going to focus on the full report. So <clears throat> the IOM was tasked with reviewing and assessing the current evidence on breast cancer in the environment considering gene interactions, reviewing the challenges and, uh, and the committee was tasked with exploring evidence-based actions that women can take to reduce their risk, as well as developing recommendations for future research in this area. And so that's clearly, this clearly reflected in the final report. So I think, before we begin, it's very important to understand how the IOM defines the environment for the purposes of this report. And, and really, we need to note that the committee's use of this word is significantly different from how most of us understand the environment. And so I think it's worth reading directly from the report. It's a little bit of a long quote, but bear with me. Uh, quote, for the purposes of this report, the committee interpreted environment broadly to encompass all factors that are not directly inherited through DNA. As a result, this definition includes elements that range from the cellular to the societal, the physiologic and developmental course of an individual, diet and other ingested substances, physical activity, microbial agents, physical and chemical agents encountered at work or at home, medical treatments and interventions, social factors, and cultural practices. For some readers, this interpretation will differ from their association of the phrase environmental risk factors primarily with pollutants and other products of industrial processes, end quote. So there's no question that these kinds of sociocultural issues are important for health, and obviously this is a, a primary premise of breast cancer actions and equities work. However, this overly broad definition takes the emphasis away from the external environment and dilutes the focus on the actual environmental causes of breast cancer. Under this definition, the committee examined evidence on exercise, abdominal fat, what a woman eats and drinks, as well as medical treatments and interventions. And as a result of this overly broad definition of the environment, much of the report's recommendations for women rehash what is already known about risk factors, where advocates were hoping to see more progress on longstanding questions about environmental links to breast cancer. The report generally concludes that more study is needed in order to understand factors that are linked to our external environment, including human-made chemicals that may be linked to breast cancer. So advocates, including most of us here on this call, typically consider the environment to refer to external surroundings. And most of us would say the environment includes physical and biological factors, including chemical interactions that affect an organism, person. Um, some would include social environment, that is the cultural community and institutions in which influence and shape a person's life. I think it's worth noting that the California Breast Cancer Research Program defines the environment as external factors which are outside of an individual's control, highlighting again the importance of studying factors beyond lifestyle when looking at causes and prevention of the disease. I want to be very clear that there's nothing wrong with studying genetic changes to tissue and stress, lifestyle choices, and changes in abdominal fat, but these factors should not be considered the environment 
to do so is a mistake and misses the opportunity to focus on the chemicals we are all exposed to in our everyday lives and the things outside of our control for which there is compelling evidence but still too little research and attention. So just to conclude on the importance of looking at physical, chemical, and biological factors that may increase the risk of breast cancer, I want to draw our attention to the President's Cancer Panel and their annual report last year focused on environment and breast cancer risk. The report stated that the panel was particularly concerned to find that the true burden of environmentally induced cancer has been grossly underestimated. The panel asserts that most environmental hazards with the potential to raise cancer risk are the product of human activity and recommends that efforts to inform the public of such harmful exposures and how to prevent them must be increased. It was certainly the hope and expectation of many advocates that this long-anticipated report by the IOM on breast cancer in the environment would go further in informing the public about harmful exposures and steps to prevent them. As advocates who want to stop cancer before it starts, this was, we believe, the IOM missed an important opportunity to do more in this area. And we'll talk later about ways advocates can leverage some of the really great material in this report to do that. So, it's now my pleasure to turn over the presentation to Ruth Ann um, at Silent Spring. Silent Spring is just a fantastic partner, and I hope that if each of you have not yet visited Silent Spring's website, you'll do so at the end of this webinar. Ruth Ann is going to talk about how scientists investigate environmental links to breast cancer and some of the IOM's findings. Thank you, and um, I'm, I'm happy to, to be here today. Um, thank you for the invitation to join to join this webinar about uh, what I think is an important report, and and why I think it's important. Uh, the Institute of Medicine report uh, reflects an evolution in thinking about environmental chemicals and breast cancer. The report goes beyond a "there's no evidence" approach that's been very common from mainstream medical uh, community, and instead. Uh, the report acknowledges how hard it is to get human data on environment chemicals and breast cancer. And, and it goes on then to discuss plausible links for chemicals and breast cancer based on experimental and laboratory evidence. And this is going to be the focus of what I'm talking about today. So I'm going to see if I can advance, advance the slides now. Oh, there we go. How do we know uh, that breast cancers uh, are preventable. Um, many of you, many of you may know this uh, already, but uh, most breast cancer uh, doesn't look like it's due to purely inherited genes and studies in twins and um, uh, other kinds of studies are uh, showing that that um, that there are other factors. And in fact, when we look at worldwide incidence of breast cancer, we can see that the rates vary quite dramatically, uh, increasing in developed countries. And this also supports the idea that there are um, preventable causes of breast cancer, that it's not uh, purely a genetic thing. And rates have, have been, uh, are, are modifiable. And, and we're all very interested in knowing how environmental chemicals might, might play a role in this. I think the reason that, that we care so much about this is the idea that if we understand this, we can prevent some cases, and that's something that we all really want to do. Uh, what kinds of studies help us learn about what causes cancer? Uh, the things that you need, you need a very a high and very well-defined exposure among very large groups people. Um, and you need a systematic follow-up of cancer incidents in those people. You need clear identification of who's exposed and who's unexposed. And so we can see really that, that those, um, those criteria are actually very difficult to meet in a, in a, in a group of women. Um, in, in looking beyond breast cancer, how have we learned about other, other uh, chemicals that we say that are known, known human carcinogens? And most of that 
information, a lot of it has come out of occupational studies. Um, and these occupational studies uh, have had have involved men um, primarily because men were working for long periods of time in these jobs and they uh, were like kind of in the same job for throughout a career so you had a, a well-defined I'm generalizing here of course but you you had a well-defined exposure um, and and off in many cases um, they had pensions and health insurance well into their retirement and those kinds of um, benefits actually provide the opportunity for tracking health outcomes in like cancer in later years and so these kinds of studies have revealed for, uh, causes of cancer but haven't been revealing for, for breast cancer uh, because they've been focused on men. Um, what the, the first occupational study of women and, and breast cancer uh, was uh, on nuns. It uh, was observed that, that nuns had higher rates of breast cancer and um, people pondered what was their occupational exposure and it's through that um, work that the focus on uh, studying reproductive risk factors and childbearing uh, uh, really evolved. Other things that we know about chemicals in breast cancer come, well, and, and cancer in general, from studying accidents and disasters. So, for example, the idea that ionizing radiation uh, causes breast cancer and other cancers is revealed by studying atomic bomb survivors. Um, and also studying pharmaceutical treatments in some cases has shown um, has shown cancer uh, as an outcome and the hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer is the mo most well known uh, for breast cancer and so those are um, those are fairly limited circumstances for 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 uh, discovering what causes cancer and the limited human data on chemicals in breast cancer has fueled skepticism in the medical community about environmental risk. And what can we do in the face of that absence of, absence of information? Um, well, there are other kinds of, other types of evidence, and they include use of animal models and, uh, and cell culture-based mechanistic models. These are tools that are used in predictive toxicology often for regulatory purposes, to identify chemicals that might be carcinogens, uh, to help reveal mechanisms, and they're used in drug discovery as well as in chemical safety testing. And uh, we're taking the point of view that if we want to prevent cancer, that we, we know something about biological mechanisms that are important for breast cancer, and we know uh, and, and are learning more about chemicals that people are exposed to, um, that if we want to prevent breast cancer, we need to act based on that evidence. We cannot um, actually wait for human, for human studies because they won't be coming. Um, but that based on biological plausibility and evidence of human exposure, we can educate, uh, reformulate, and regulate, take other kinds of action to reduce exposure and uh, hopefully to reduce risk mechanisms that we uh, focus on in terms of breast cancer relevance. Uh, one are the classical mammary carcinogens that damage DNA. That would be like ionizing radiation. Um, the endocrine disruptors are hormonally active chemicals that can act like um, hormones like estrogen or progesterone and promote the growth of tumors that have already been initiated. And a third mechanism of uh, endocrine disruptors also, but early in life or during development in utero and early life, maybe during puberty, um, that endocrine disruptors act as developmental toxicants. They affect how the breast develops in a way that alters the susceptibility of the breast to another carcinogenic insult. So those are mechanisms that we focus on and, and, and based on those we've identified chemicals that acts by those different mechanisms and we've done exposure work to see how women are exposed uh, and can get more information um, about all of this 
either on, on our website and in a, in a set of papers um, that we've published. Now these, um, the reviews in cancer, the 2007 papers, uh, were actually part of a state of the science review that the Susan G. Komen Foundation funded us to do. And, um, and we're very um, happy to see that, that our basic uh, thinking and approach of looking at animal evidence and considering it relevant and uh, acknowledging the difficulty in getting human evidence was really uh, was adopted in the IOM report, although you wouldn't know that from reading media coverage or, uh, or even the briefs or summary materials that were developed about the report. Um, coming back to the President's Cancer Panel, which, um, which also reflected this, this same kind of shift from uh, that we can't wait for human evidence. <clears throat> um, in the, the report that came out in 2010, they said our nation has much work ahead to identify many existing but unrecognized environmental carcinogens and eliminate those that are known. And they further said that an environmental health paradigm for long latency diseases, diseases where the exposure happens way, way early compared to when the effect does, uh, we need a new, a new paradigm to enable regulatory action based on compelling animal and in vitro or cell, cell culture evidence uh, before cause and effect in humans has been proven. That is, we cannot wait for human studies. So this point of view has been articulated in some uh, mainstream um, you know, uh, research documents. Some key statements uh, that we found in the IOM report that acknowledges the difficulty in obtaining human evidence. Uh, relies on mechanistic and animal studies to identify chemicals with plausible links. It recommends improved methods for chemical safety testing. This is really quite radical for a, uh, a, med a medical uh, group that's talking about breast cancer to even talk about chemical testing. Uh, but that's a specific recommendation. Um, it recommends limiting exposures that are plausible contributors to risk. It calls out three chemicals as probably human breast carcinogens. Benzene and butadiene are exposures to those chemicals are primarily through auto exhaust and gasoline. Ethylene oxide is a gas, a gas sterilant that's used in medical sterilization and uh, some food sterilization. Really, the primary exposure is to workers uh, working with it, not so much consumers. Um, all three of these also uh, exposure to cigarettes, to tobacco smoke um, produces exposure to these chemicals. But, but this is, uh, was very important that they named these three chemicals because um, that we had named them previously, but, they, but no main authoritative medical body had, had, had uh, named chemicals as being probably human breast carcinogens prior to this. It highlights endocrine disrupting chemicals as research priorities. Uh, it acknowledges gaps in consumer product safety testing. It lays out an ambitious research agenda uh, that, that has a lot of great recommendations. So um, in our perspective is that it's an important step forward, uh, first statement by an authoritative medical group that scientific evidence plausibly links pollutants with biological activity that suggests breast cancer risk. But in addition to the three chemicals they named as probable risks, we would probably add um, PAHs, which are uh, products of combustion, again, from auto exhaust and pollution, and smoke. PCBs, which are industrial uh, chemicals that were used. Um, they were banned in the mid-early 70s, but they were used in building materials. And so they still exist in some uh, older buildings, and uh, they were used as caulks and as floor finishes. And they're also bioaccumulative, so exposure is still significant through uh, fish in some parts of the country, primarily fish. 
and then organic solvents. So um, uh, glues, like rubber cement and um, glues and um, degreasers, some spot removers, um, and then a lot of uh, occupational exposures occurs to organic solvents. So those also have, um, I think, a similar amount of evidence to the three chemicals that they named. And we might add them as, as probable or uh, you know, best carcinogen. Uh, our sense is that the report doesn't go far enough in supporting action to modernize chemical re regulation. So they talk about um, people should know that chemicals aren't really tested, but they don't really say, and we should change the, that, that practice. Um, and it lays out an ambitious and very expensive research agenda that I'm not sure Coleman has fully embraced. They have said that they're, um, I saw in the, in the paper that they were going to commit $5 million, but there's a lot in that report, and a lot of it doesn't have to do with environmental chemicals, and $5 million in research doesn't actually go very far. So um, I think uh, something that advocates can really make a difference by asking both um, governmental organizations and, and the big cancer organizations to commit significant resources to the environmental uh, research agenda. Uh, anyway, he wants um, more information. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, resources on our website. Um, we have a more detailed perspective on the ILM report written up. We have a commentary that was published about it, and uh, uh, all of our scientific papers, we try to buy the rights so that they're available without description on our site if you go to our publication. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Ruthann, for that great summary and commentary on some of the key findings of the IOM's report. Um, you all do such important work over there, and it's wonderful to get your perspective today. So turning from the IOM report's findings and building on some of your comments on the Silent Springs perspective, I want to turn now to the recommendations in the IOM, IOM report about where we go from here. Uh, first, I want to note that there are a few different sets of recommendations. Evidence-based actions that women can take, again, this was a, a piece of the um, assignment that, that the committee was given, uh, and those are really, the summary document really focuses on those recommendations for women. And then there's recommendations for further research in the full report that, you know, Chapter 7 is devoted to that. Um, and there are a few recommendations regarding public policy, uh, but we'll talk more about that. So a lot of folks have noted that we've long known many of the things the report highlights as areas that women can take action. There was a lot of commentary on the IOM summary document for the public. Several people noticed the rather patronizing tone and the, you know, quote, unremarkable recommendations, but all we need to do is make really good, healthy choices. Most of the recommendations for women are simply a rehash of what's already known based on already identified risk factors, and I, I want to talk about um, some of the issues there. So yes, of course we should all exercise, we should avoid harmful things like ionizing radiation, hormone replacement therapy, alcohol and cigarette smoke, and postmenopausal weight gain. Um, folded into these recommendations is, is an additional recommendation that women may want to, quote, avoid chemicals plausibly linked to breast cancer, end quote, um, without details really on how to do that. And so in terms of talking about the limits of this approach, um, the report spends time discussing the fact that even when, so this is the full report, acknowledges that even when risk factors have been identified, it's not at all clear what actions should be taken in order to reduce risk. While there's been plenty of evidence on ionizing radiation over the years, there's less clarity on how to avoid it. What are unnecessary medical tests? Who decides? Where does mammography, which is, of course, ionizing radiation fit? When preventative steps need to be taken, for example, identifying uh, postmenopausal weight gain as a risk factor, that still leaves open the question of whether losing that weight can reverse the risks that may have accumulated at a younger age. And of course, in urging women to consider avoiding chemicals plausibly linked to breast cancer, there is the real question of whether alternative consumer products are any better. 
the report actually cites the example of BPA. And this is an estrogenic chemical found in food packaging, among other uses. BPA is widely sort of known in the public for its use in baby bottles. Now, the IOM report notes that 90% of BPA-free products containing alternative chemicals also demonstrate estrogenic effects. And because of our innocent until proven guilty chemical testing process and our failure to safety test chemicals before they are brought to market, there is no guarantee that alternatives are, in fact, any safer. There are some really there's some additional problems with this message that women should take responsibility for preventing their breast cancer. Risk factors identified in this report were identified on studies focusing on white postmenopausal women. And all breast cancers. It's not clear that these factors impart the same risk in other racial and ethnic groups or for women at younger ages. Now, I'm always very concerned about messages that suggest to women that they are responsible for their own breast cancers. And I talk to far too many women who blame themselves for this disease that is still largely not understood. Focusing on individual action has the potential to deepen inequities. In a society where there are enormous socioeconomic differences, we have to examine access, including access to so-called safer alternatives. Uh, these are the kind of consumer-based activism. There's currently striking inequities in breast cancer incidence and mortality that cannot be resolved and, in fact, may be worsened by making individuals responsible for keeping themselves and their families safe. And, and finally, Dr. Robert Hyatt, who's one of the IOM committee members, he's at UCSF, um, the committee acknowledges, and, and Dr. Hyatt stated at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, that even if women follow the recommendations of the IOM's report, we still don't know whether they will actually reduce their risk. And so this emphasis on individual action gives women a false sense of control, a false sense of responsibility, and distracts from the larger policy issues that ultimately have the most impact on the most women. So turning from the recommendations for women to the recommendations for future research, Despite the committee's overly broad definition of the environment and the focus on recommendations for women, there are some really important findings and recommendations in the full report. Uh, and they provide a foundation for advocacy. Ruth Ann has talked about some of these, and I want to just highlight four uh, areas that, that we're excited about. The report recognizes that breast cancer is a complex disease with complex causes. And the committee recommends a transdisciplinary approach to uh, really to understand the disease better. And while I'm not going to spend time on it today, I want to draw your attention to um, a complexity model that's presented in the report in Chapter 4. And I urge you to, uh, to look at that offline. The complexity model groups risk factors into four key areas. The first is biological, so those are things like age, ancestry, genetic mutations, etc. The second is behavioral. So that's alcohol, breastfeeding, age of first birth, et cetera. Um, the third is societal and cultural. So that's the country of birth, education, income, those sorts of factors. And finally, physical and chemical factors, uh, including chemicals in the environment, such as endocrine disruptors and radiation. And by grouping the risk factors and acknowledging there's a complex interplay in these factors, uh, the report, I think, makes a, a a good recommendation that we really need transdisciplinary focus on understanding the root causes of and, and prevention of breast cancer. Additionally, the committee affirms that the growing body of evidence that there are some critical windows of susceptibility throughout the full course of a woman's life. Um, Ruthanne has already referenced, you know, endocrine structures can act early in life to affect breast cancer risk many years later, and uh, some of those Critical windows of susceptibility include young adulthood, puberty, childhood, and even in utero exposures. And this further underscores breast cancer actions focus on prevention through precaution and our commitment to the precautionary approach. Um, the mantra of this report is really more study is needed. And, and we actually agree. We should devote resources to better understanding things that appear to increase a woman's risk of breast cancer. Some of the things highlighted in the report include chemicals with hormonal activity, mutagenic chemicals. Now, mutagens are those um, chemicals which change the genetic material of an organism and increase the frequency of DNA mutation. So many mutagens are carcinogenic and, and cause cancer. 
Uh, a third category is shift work, which disrupts the natural circadian rhythms, which is the body's biological clock. Uh, and that's an intriguing area of research. The fourth is epigenetic activity. And epigenetics really affects the gene expression rather than changes to the genome itself. And the fifth is gene environment interaction. So absolutely, we need to follow up in these areas of concern. And while we await the results of that data, we must take precautionary measures now. The fourth area that I want to call out is, um, and Ruthann has already talked about this, is, is the report's recommendations to remedy some of the shortcomings of uh, our current research methodology, including expanding on epidemiological studies and developing better measurements and assessment tools uh, and, and more studies of exposed populations. While these are really good recommendations, I want to note that the recommendations don't include a discussion of why some populations are disproportionately exposed to known and suspected toxins. And of course, breast cancer action is always concerned with identifying and remedying health inequities. So this, these are good things that I think advocates can leverage, and, and they're not, there's a lot of places where we need to take this further. So while the IOM includes some important recommendations, um, I want to highlight some of our primary concerns. The first is that, as I mentioned in the last slide, there's no attention paid to inequities in breast cancer incidence and outcome. And the recommendations do not call this out as an important area of research. I think that's a, a missed opportunity. The second is that including chemo prevention as the seventh recommendation in a report on breast cancer and the environment is entirely inappropriate. Chemo prevention, for those of you who don't know, is the use of drugs prior to a breast cancer diagnosis in order to reduce risk. So an example of that is that the drug tamoxifen has long been used to treat breast cancer, and it's sometimes used to reduce the risk of breast cancer, although it does have very serious side effects, and in Europe it's in fact classified as carcinogen. Breast cancer action has a long-standing position on pills for, pills for prevention. I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, you can find that on our website. But I think it can be widely agreed that recommending study of pharmacological risk reduction as well as uh, out, this focus on chemo prevention is just well outside the bounds of a report on breast cancer and the environment. And another missed opportunity, which we will talk about as in the coming slides is the failure to follow up with really strong public policy recommendations for population level interventions. The report notes that from a public health policy and practice perspective, it's important to determine where risks fly and the potential for benefit and risk at a population level. And, uh, and so this is, a, I think, a place where the report falls short and we have some recommendations. So before I do that, I do want to note that the committee does um, note, as, as Ruthann mentioned, that FDA regulatory authority is inadequate. And there are a couple of suggestions in the report to remedy this, at least partially. Uh, the summary document doesn't go into that and simply states that consumers and physicians should be advised about the limits of the FDA's role. And I think um, knowing that the FDA, that chemicals aren't properly regulate, regulated is a wholly inadequate solution to this very important problem. In terms of the recommendations that the report does make for strengthening the FDA, um, it includes better preclinical screening tests or hormonally active pharmaceutical products that can be used before such products are brought to market, that is to help evaluate their potential for increasing the risk of breast cancer, as well as empowering the FDA to require post-marketing studies or hormonally active prescription drugs, which have not yet been evaluated with regard to breast cancer risk. I think a third area is the report somewhat weakly recommends that the FDA should be able to prospectively survey or detect contaminants or ingredients in cosmetics and dietary supplements, including estrogenic substances, which are known uh, or possible causes of breast cancer. Uh, but, but it doesn't go really give up much weight to that. And I think that's a place we want to strengthen uh, the recommendation. So looking at the public policy implications of this report, I want to begin by saying that breast cancer action has long held that we must employ the precautionary principle while we seek additional information about environmental toxins that may increase the risk of breast cancer. Yes, the gold standard for uh, you know, environmental causes might be 
random controlled experiments on humans. However, we cannot do those as you know, ethically, it's immoral to expose women to known and suspected toxins that might increase the risk of breast cancer. And so we do need to, as Ruthanne, you know, very well laid out, look at some alternative ways of getting data. And while those studies are underway, we believe that we already have enough information to act in the interest of public health now. We heard earlier, uh, the Iowa report repeatedly states that further study is needed, but in the meantime, even in the absence of scientific consensus, we must act on the balance of evidence to stop breast cancer before it starts. I, we also you know, want to advocate to give the FDA the teeth it currently lacks. This is not just a question of hormonally active drugs. We need to empower the FDA to adequately regulate, and that is to conduct pre- and post-market safety testing for all, all pharmaceutical food that's genetically engineered. We've done a lot of work on RBGH over the years, as well as health and beauty products, which we covered in our last webinar. Of course, many of our members know that we support uh, toxic control substances, the, the Toxic Substances Control Act reform. And um, there's a little typo there. And at a time when more than half of all breast cancers have no known risk factors. We must neither blame women for their breast cancer nor give them false hope. Instead of getting distracted by individual choices, we must focus on the systemic changes that will protect all women. And so looking at this report, whether you are someone who is at risk for breast cancer or living with breast cancer now, whether you're a researcher or an advocate, if you have not already, I urge you to read the full report because the summary of brief is significantly different. And we have a link to the full report at the end of this webinar. By understanding and articulating the shortcomings and the strengths of this report, you can urge other breast cancer organizations to consider how they use their resources. Specifically, encourage researchers and funders to devote resources to studying actual environmental links to breast cancer. That is adopting a rigorous definition of environment. Definitely, we encourage you to, to urge researchers and funders to implement the best of the report's recommendations. And of course, we would like to see the incorporation of a social justice analysis in working to address the inequities in breast cancer incidence and mortality. Together, we can call for rigor in the definition of environment rather than this overly broad use individual lifestyle changes as the only answers. I suggest you get involved with organizations that will work to turn the science into policy changes to protect us all. And so in conclusion, there's some really important insights and advances in the IOM's report on breast cancer and the environment. However, the report falls short in some really important areas. And in many ways, the report itself, with its repeated mantra of more study is needed, calls out for the kind of report that advocates hoped this would be. Thank you so much, Karuna and Ruthann. Uh, I just want to let you know we will be opening it up to your questions in a few minutes. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit more about how you can get involved. Become a member. Sign up for news and action alert emails from Breast Cancer Action to keep up to date on the issues. Join us on Facebook and Twitter to connect with others and help change the conversation about the breast cancer epidemic. You can also help others get involved, tell your friends, co-workers and family about this webinar and how they can take action. Last, donate to support our action and our ed education and advocacy work. Also, join us next month for our next webinar, which will focus on the brand new Think Before You Pink Toolkit, which provides resources, information, and tools you need to understand the truth behind pink mar ribbon marketing the conflicts of interest in the cancer industry, and why so many women are still being diagnosed, as well as how to help others learn about it, too. It's free and available for download from our website at bcaction.org. Again, I want to provide links um, to the things that we've referred to in our webinar. To obtain a version of the full report, go to www.iom.edu slash report and look for the report titled Breast Cancer and the Environment, a Life Course Approach. 
the date on that is December 2011. For more information about Silent Spring Institute and to see their latest research, go to www.silentspring.org. You can view their perspective on the IOM report as well as read their research studies and publications. For Breast Cancer Action's educational and advocacy materials, go to www.bcaction.org and click on Resources to view our fact sheets, download the Think Before You Pink toolkit, and view our past and upcoming webinars. Safer Chemicals and Healthy Families is a coalition of diverse groups that is concerned about toxic chemicals in our homes, places of work, and products we use every day. And they're working to help pass smart federal policies that protect us from these toxic chemicals. Again, I want to remind you that BC Action relies on your support to make these webinars possible. Your individual support of our work is crucial. If you've been inspired today, please consider making a donation of $25 or more so we can continue these webinars. Go to www.bcaction.org backslash donate. I want to give a big thank you to Karuna and Ruth Ann for their presentation today. Now I'd like to open it up to the questions you may have on this topic. I just want to remind you that you can continue to write questions in the box and we will try to answer as many as we can. So uh, we're going to start with, um, with um, someone asked just a clarification question. Um, what is FDA and TSCA? So the FDA is the Federal Drug Administration, food, food, food and drug. drug, sorry, Food and Drug Administration. And the TSCA is the Toxic Substances Control Act. That's Let's get some of your. I'm sorry, Ruthann, did you want to say something? I was just going to say I was just going to explain Toxic Substances Control Act is the primary okay. uh, law that uh, regulates chemicals in commerce, commercial chemicals, uh, in, in terms of safety. Thank you for that. Um, someone asks. Is there or will there be sorry, a convenient place to read for those of us not visually oriented, not orally oriented, orally oriented, oriented but visually, Karuna's very usefully constructive critical summary following Ruth Ann Rudell's great presentation. This would be useful information to have for follow-up subsequent conversations in months ahead. Um, so we will have the recorded webinar um, for anyone to view up on our website by the end of next week. So you can um, you can watch and hear the webinar again if you if you would like. If there's anything that you didn't catch or want to hear again. And um, on the Silent Spring site, we have a a kind of a perspective on. Um, more, more on the science um, aspects that I raised, but but in, includes a little bit of policy um, that's written. Someone wants to be reading. Great, thank you, Ruthann. Um, someone asks, can you expand on transdisciplinary for study recommendations for research? Um, Ruthann, do you feel like you'd like to take that? Is it something you can answer? Um, yeah, I think um, the IOM focus on that is uh, a way of saying that there, uh, it's not just going to be doctors and epidemiologists who are going to um, produce new understanding on this topic, that it's going to take uh, exposure scientists, and environmental scientists, and chemists, and uh, toxicologists, and also because of the interactions between behavioral and built environment and socio social factors um, that uh, you know sociologists and uh, e economists and and many uh, different uh, perspectives I guess uh, need to come together in order to to figure out how to, how to get the information that we need in this difficult environment thank you so much Another listener asks, uh, I chose to take tamoxifen for five years following my breast cancer surgery. I was reluctant, but after reading and conferring with my doctor, it seemed the best choice. Now I feel maybe I shouldn't have. What is your response on this concern? 
Uh, this is Karuna, and I just want to apologize if I gave that uh, the perception that one should never take tamoxifen. What I was referring to is chemo prevention, and so that is the use of drugs before a breast cancer diagnosis in order to reduce risk. And what I'm saying, while breast cancer action does have a policy on pills for prevention, my not, my main point for this webinar is that looking at chemo prevention in a report on breast cancer in the environment is entirely inappropriate. Uh, you know, anytime we can talk about chemo, chemo prevention, we can talk about unintended consequences, and um, that does not mean necessarily that uh, one shouldn't take tamoxifen. That's not in any way what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that prescribing a strong drug to a healthy population um, is something that breast cancer action takes. You know, we're talking about drugs for healthy people, and that's very different than than taking drugs for treatment of a disease which, you know, you've actually been diagnosed with and treated for. Thank you, Corinna. Um, someone asks, seeing the differences in geographical locations and risks to breast cancer, can we deduce more circumstantial evidence with respect to environmental risk factors? Ruthann, do you have a sense of that, an answer to that? Um, well, people do look at that, but the, the problem is that there are so many differences between what, um, what a woman's life is like in a developing country and a developed country, and that in addition to uh, a lot of environmental chemicals, there are many uh, nutritional and lifestyle factors, uh, body size and other things that are also different. And since everything varies together, it's difficult to figure out which, which ones are the most important. Thank you. Um, if there's any last questions, I think we're going to wrap up the webinar. I'm, going to see, I'm just going to look through. I'm scrolling to see, see make sure we've answered as many questions as we can in the time allowed. Um, all right, I think what we're going to do now is um, end the webinar. Thank you all very much for your thoughtful questions and comments. Um, and again, if we didn't answer your question today, please follow up with us at info at bcaction.org. Also, again, as I um, said earlier, that if you would like to view the webinar again, we will make it available on our website by the end of next week. Thank you so much for attending. And please watch your email for a short survey where you can provide feedback on this webinar.